approve an RPT, it's a fundamental principle covered in section 184 by 2, 184 by 2, that interested directors shall not participate in such board meetings. So we'll have to exclude interested directors both for the purpose of quorum as for the purpose of approving the contract. Interested directors shall not participate in the board meeting in which RPT is being discussed. Once again, you have probably been comfortable over the years. This concept of interested directors not participating in board meetings, has it ever been applicable to private company? In the past, interested in case of private companies, all directors are interested directors after all. We don't have anything called disinterested directors or uninterested directors in case of private company. Every director is my family person, is bound to be interested. Whatever the company does, he's obviously an interested person. So where is the question of directors not being interested in the matter in case of private companies? You like it or not, but section 184 by 2 of the Companies Act is applicable to all directors of all companies. In other words, interested directors in case of private companies as well will have to refrain, recuse from participating in the board meeting where the matter in which they are interested comes for discussion. So interested directors cannot participate. In other words, only disinterested directors can decide on the matter. So 188 by 1, the first the, we said second requirement is the board meeting shall resolve the matter and the board shall exclude those directors who are interested in the matter. That's the second requirement. Up till now, you don't find much of a problem still because we still think it's perfectly fine to manage. Let's say probably might have board consisting of some disinterested directors also and therefore you might get the approval of the board. Board approval is not a problem. After all, my company, I can manage my board. Now comes the third approval. If the company is covered by a paid up capital threshold or the contract is covered by a contract size threshold, so I'm talking about two thresholds here, the threshold pertaining to size of the company, I'll call it a large company. The company is large because it meets a particular threshold, one requirement. Second requirement, the contract size is large. So if you read it the way the regulation stands, it is either the company is large or the contract is large. As it seems to say that if the company is large, we anyway need the special requirement. If the contract value is large, even if the company is small, we still need the special approval. If the company is large, even if the contract size is small, we still need the approval. If the contract, if the company is small but the contract size is large, we would still need the special approval. What is the special approval I'm talking about? The special approval is a very special case of a special approval. It's a double special, special, special resolution. Special, special resolution. We all understand what's a special resolution. That's something that I don't need to tell you about what is special resolution. But this special resolution, which is applicable when either of these two thresholds are hit, is a special case of a special resolution because in this meeting, it's a general meeting we're talking about, in this general meeting, related parties shall not vote. It's a special resolution of shareholders excluding the related parties, which sounds extremely funny. In a general meeting, after all, why do shareholders vote? They vote to protect their interest. So I'm saying this meeting is a special case where those people who are interested in the matter, they will not be voting. So we'll have a special majority of the minority. This rule globally is called majority of the minority rule. Majority of the minority. That is, of the minority, the majority will approve. But in India, the rule has become even more stringent because it's special majority of the minority. Let me state the rigor of the rule so as to make you understand what this rule is all about. Supposing my capital is 100 crores, of which 60% is held by related parties because they're holding companies of the group or uh, let's say controlling companies would be, directors would be controlling the shareholding, holding companies are controlling shareholding. So 60% of my holding is with my related parties. Those people will not be eligible to vote. Now we're left with 40% who can vote. Of the 40% I need, 75% can sit. So 75% of the 40, that would mean even if somebody holding 10% capital in the company opposes the resolution, the resolution would never get carried. For that matter, if all my shareholders are related parties, the resolution cannot be carried at all. If the resolution cannot be carried, where do I go? But the answer is quite simple. I don't do the contract then. Because we need three-stage approval, audit committee, board of directors, and the special, special resolution. I don't care whether the special resolution cannot be passed or not. That's not my concern because special resolution cannot be cast, passed. Don't do the contract. But the contract has to be approved by the a special majority of the disinterested minority. Majority shareholders cannot vote. The contract has to be approved by a special majority of the disinterested minority. That is the big issue in terms of Section 188. 
the section became applicable from 1st April only. People are yet trying to understand the rigor of the section. Some people may not have understood, understood or realized the rigor of the section. My apprehension is that lots and lots of later party contracts, RPD contracts are a way of life. We can't do away without, we can't do away with RPD contracts. Contracts happen within the group, enormous number of contracts, sale purchase contract, agency contract, commission contract, sharing of office infrastructure, sharing of space, service contracts, enormous amount of related party contracts happen everywhere. And if these contracts are happening and the company is covered by the thresholds, in that case the contract cannot be done without passing a special, special resolution. The special, special resolution would be really a nightmare for any company. Now, I must, while before I talk about what, what the thresholds are, I must quickly brief you here that if the contract, as we talked about the special, special resolution, what is the manner of taking special resolution? How do you get a special resolution passed? Good old mindset is that we just call a meeting, we get shareholders assembled, and we get a resolution passed. But this good old mindset of calling a meeting, calling a meeting at a particular place, let's say we, I, 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 call, the, I call the meeting, at a weird place. If it's an EGM, I can call it any weird place just to ensure shareholders don't appear there and I'm therefore make sure that small trouble, turbulent shareholders are not even present. I have my own field day. I can get a resolution passed the way I feel like. Now, please do understand in case of listed companies and in case of companies having 1,000 or more shareholders, for any general meeting, it is a mandatory requirement to, to require, to, to allow shareholders to vote electronically. E-voting is a mandatory requirement for all listed companies and companies having more than 1,000 shareholders. So the meeting is not, you cannot do away with shareholder democracy by calling the meeting at a weird place, cordoned off place and ensure that turbulent shareholders are not even allowed to enter the place because the meeting will have to be, the meeting will have to allow the e-voting option. E-voting means what? E-voting would mean every shareholder would be allowed a login ID and password. Shareholders would log into their computer, vote from their computers, cast their vote yes or no. There will be obviously no scope for interaction. There's no interaction in e-voting. There's nothing that you go to explain or ask. You just put up an explanatory statement, that's it. Let shareholders decide based on the computers, on the computers. So shareholder democracy has a full play here and therefore it's quite likely that the special, special resolution because of opposition of small shareholders may not get passed, in which case RPD contracts really get blocked. So the thresholds now, now let's just come to the thresholds. As the law appears, the thresholds seem to be paid up capital of rupees 10 crores or more. Paid up capital of 10 crores or above. One part, that's a large size company, 10 crores or above. I said two things, large size company or large, large size contract. So one part is paid up capital of 10 crores or more, that's a large, large size contract, large size company. Now talk about large size contract. When do we say the contract is large size contract? If the annual volume, annual value of the contract, if it's a sale or purchase of goods or services, annual volume is 20, 25% or more of the company's turnover. Which company's turnover? My company's turnover. 25% or more of my company's turnover in one year, the contract is a large contract. If it's rendering of services or leasing of properties, then the contract value is 10% or more of my net worth, then it's a large contract. If it's appointment of relatives to an office or place of profit, if the salary, monthly salary is two and a half lakhs per month or more, the, the, the contract is a material contract. So all material contracts by large companies will require this special, special resolution. Now the key issue that remains here, we said large company or large contract. As per law, the word in between is or, large company or large contract, which means what? If the company is large, even a small contract will require approval. If the company is small, even a large contract will require approval. So either of the two thresholds being satisfied, will the special, special resolution be still applicable? My view is, and I've done a lot of thinking on this, my view is that this word or has to be read as and. The word is or, or is usually a disjunctive, but in context of this section, I have to use this disjunctive into a conjunctive sense. Why do I say so big? Otherwise, the section would lose its meaning altogether. For instance, supposing I have a small company, it's a cell phone company. What is minority in a cell phone country? The rule requires special resolution of the minority. I don't have anything called a minority in my company because the entire company is cell phone. I don't have a majority versus minority at all. If I don't have a minority, the company is completely cell phone. Does it make intuitive sense to say that I cannot do self-dealing 
that is dealing with myself if the company is my own company. On the contrary, I would say the need for a special resolution would be all the more if there is a public stake in the company. If the company is my own company, self-owned company, why would anybody at all have any problem if I do a self-dealing? If what I do in my house, why would anybody have any concern on that? So my view is that this word or has to be read as and. And then the meaning becomes transparent, the meaning becomes logical. But as per law, the word is still appearing as or. Though with the SEBI's note that came yesterday, I am still getting more force in my view that the word has to be end. I will come to SEBI's note in a minute from now. So what is this? Uh, why, why? So in my view, the correct way to interpret the special threshold requirement is that if the company is large and the company is entering into a large contract, large contract by large companies will require the special special resolution. Small contract by small companies, anyway doesn't come in picture. Large contract by small companies, since the company is small, should not make any difference. The company is large, but the contract is small, should not make a difference. The company is large and the contract is large. That's where the special resolution must be required. That's my view. Let's, supposing we violate section 188. We violate section 188, what's the consequence? Now, I better not tell you and spoil your uh, weekend by telling you the consequences. For most of the provisions of Companies Act, the consequences are pretty simple, boring consequence. Six months in jail, one year in jail, three years in jail, five years in jail. So it's, it's a very boring, it's boring law. Almost every section says the same. Three years in jail, two years in jail. Quantity, magnitude differs a bit. Six months, eight months, eight months, two months, that's it. It's a system whole change, few lakhs here, few lakhs there. But the consequence is always very boring. It's always a extremely very, I think, most routine consequences. You spend few years in jail and you pay few lakhs in fine. So consequence always invariably. In case of a listed company, directors go in jail. Not just the directors, the employee who authorized the contract also. The beautiful part is that RPD contracts, who authorizes contracts? Directors don't all the time sign contracts. For example, if I hire a space or hire an interior designer, who is my, let's say, director's wife, who signs the contract? Not direct, this probably would be signed by a procurement officer, a purchase officer. So in that case, the poor purchase officer, the procurement officer, spends six months in jail. So imprisonment is applicable to even the director or the employee who authorized the contract. That's not all. That's not all. So let me just take you forward. If the directors have been convicted of an offense involving RPD contracts, remember with Nilesh Vikams, he was talking about if the auditor is removed by NCLT, he will not be auditor of any company for next five years. He's rusticated from auditing profession. For five years, he can't do any audit. Likewise here, if directors are convicted of an RPD offense, for next five years, he is banished from corporate boardrooms. He must not enter the boardroom of any company. In other words, he cannot be a director of any company, any company, small company, large company, even his company. His company also can't be director of any company for next five years. So director would be disqualified, cor disqualified from corporate boardrooms altogether for a term of five years. This is the extremely rigorous provision of Section 188. Now, I just add the rigor that was imposed, superimposed on this rigor by SEBI's Clause 49 yesterday. SEBI has come up with a revised Clause 49. I'm sure some of you are aware of that. The, what's the implication of Clause 49? Clause 49 amends the listing agreement and therefore it's applicable to all listed companies. The appointed date for applicability of revised Clause 49 would be 1st of October. From 1st October, this new provision would be applicable to all listed companies. Now the provision becomes even more rigorous when it comes to SEBI's definition of RPD contracts. In what way does it become different? First, the definition of related party under SEBI's definition is much, much broader than definition of related party under the Companies Act. It's substantially broader because it includes all companies within a group. If you have designated an entity as a group company coming under common control, then as for SEBI, it comes under definition of related party. Companies Act definition is still narrow and maneuverable. But the SEBI's definition of related parties is based on control. So all entities under common control, even fellow associates, fellow subsidies, fellow joint ventures, all of these are taken as related parties. That's one difference. Second difference, Section 188 is applicable to only certain types of RPTs. Like I mentioned, a loan contract is not covered. But SEBI's RPT provisions are applicable to every RPT, every related party transaction. And the way the word is defined, any transaction involving any obligation, goods or services. After all, any contract would either involve resources or would involve obligations or would involve services. So even provision of a guarantee, giving of a loan, 
providing of any kind of accommodation to a, 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 a related party related party would come under sebi's definition sebi requires prior audit committee approval in case of other companies it's not prior approval in case of sebi it's prior prior approval sebi's definition of material rpd contract just now if you recall if you still recall what i said in case of turnover i said 25% is the threshold under the company act for sebi the threshold is 5% 5% of turnover or 20% of net worth so the threshold is much narrower now sebi basically requires three things number one prior approval by audit committee number two the company must have an rpt policy and the policy must be placed on the company's website and for any material rpt contracts a special special resolution of the type i just discussed will be required and there will be a special disclosure of all rpd transactions in a quarterly corporate governance report there will be a quarterly cap corporate governance report filed by the company with the stock exchange in which details of all rpd contracts will be listed in the quarterly corporate governance report filed by the company with stock exchange these are four additional requirements of sebi's clause 49 that were introduced yesterday but effective 1st october so that's section 188 dealing with related party contracts i'm not sure what's the best way but Do you want questions on this section right now, or shall we continue with the other two sections so that by that time you would have probably forgotten some of your questions? I'll probably have more comfortable time. And in case you have questions, please do mark them. I'll be happy to cover all questions on section 180. I don't want to violate protocol that the chairman has fixed. So let's move on to the other two sections: section 185, section 186. Section 185 is not new because section 185 was introduced. Is that a question? Thank you. Section 185 was introduced from 12 September already. Section has been there for more than six months already. Section was introduced from 12 September, and this section applies to loans, guarantees, and securities to directors and direct directors interested entities. Directors and direct directors interested entities. Section corresponds to Section 295 of the earlier Act. Section 295 was not a prohibition. Section 295 just said. in case we are giving a loan to a director we need to up, take approval of central government that approval was coming locally and was therefore not a very great difficult approval section was not applicable to a private company section was not applicable between holding substitute in, in case of holding substitute transaction so that was scope of section 185 was um, section 295 was a far easier section to tackle in the past now section 185 is applicable to all companies small large big private public all kinds of companies are covered by section 185 section is applicable to every company section doesn't require any approval section is a straight prohibition section that is for transactions covered by section 185 it's a straight prohibition you can't just do it there's no way to do it if the contract is covered by section 185 you just cannot do that section 185 now section 185 talks about three things loans guarantees and provision of securities section 185 also applied to what is called de facto loan advances in the nature of a loan a book debt represent a, rep, a loan represented by a book debt that is if there is a book debt which is serving the purpose of a loan so not every book debt is covered by section 185 not every book debt but if the book debt is merely granting a kind of a financial accommodation by way of a protracted extended credit period to a director that would also be covered by section 185 so 185 will therefore include all loan transactions all guarantees all provision of securities and all trade debt which is in the nature of a loan in other words a trade debt which extends beyond normal credit periods so as to provide a financial accommodation to a director that's a trade debt in the nature of a loan so section 185 applies to those transactions also now where all the section apply the section is applicable in case of such transactions to a director beneficiary is a director borrower is a director borrower or the beneficiary is a director director himself or his relative the director or his relative or a partnership firm in which a director is a partner or a private company of which such director is a director or member a private company of which such director is a director or member that's also covered by explanation c below 185 by 1 185 by 1 explanation d says a body corporate at a general meeting of which 25% or more voting power can be exercised or controlled by a director or directors repeating once again a body corporate at a general meeting of which 25% or more voting power 
can be exercised or controlled by whom? By a director or directors put together. So director or directors hold 25% stake in the company or otherwise can control 25% voting in the company, in the beneficiary company, then explanation D will capture this transaction as well. Explanation E says a company where the board of directors is accustomed to act as per directions of a director or directors of the lending company. Accustomed to act as per directions. What's the meaning of accustomed to act as per directions? Mr. Sanjay Baru knows what is accustomed to act as per directions. <laughs> so that would mean the directors of the beneficiary company, they don't have a brain. They don't have a spine. I'm not referring to Sanjay Baru's book, right? I'm still talking about Companies Act. Huh? The book. But the, my observation, I hope, can still go. There's no election commission code on that. So I'm not referring to, I'm referring to a situation where the directors have no brain, they have no spine. They have no brain because they can't think. They get instruction, they have no spine to withstand. So they just do what they're told. They do what they're, what they're told to do. Do as directed people. They just exactly do what they're told to do. That's what is called acting as per direction. So the majority of the board of directors of the company acts as per directions of some Babu. I am just a Ramu taking instructions. The Ramu does what the Babu says him to told, ask him to do. So the, the directors of the borrowing company, the beneficiary company are Ramus acting as per directions of the Babus. Then this situation also is covered by explanation E below section 185 by 1. These are five situations which are covered by 185 by 1. Now, one common question that very commonly comes up is, is this section applicable to transactions between holding and subsidiary companies? A holding company provides financial assistance to a subsidiary company. Is the section applicable? You would have probably seen the rules brought out some exemptions. That there is an exemption does not mean the section is applicable. We have to read the applicability of the section first and then read the carve-outs. Exemption is a carve-out. It's an exemption. It's a way out. But is the section applicable in the first place? We need first to decide the applicability of the section and think, then think of carve-outs. The section refers to a wholly owned subsidiary company, the, the rules refer to a wholly owned subsidiary company as well. What I fail to understand quite often is where does section 185 by 1 at all apply to a wholly owned subsidiary company? Section talks about five situations, loan to a director, I am not lending to a director. Loan to a private company, I am not lending to a private company. I am not, neither might be lending to a private, I mean a, a private company. Or I may not be lending to a body corporate, general meeting of which 25% voting control can be exercised by directors. If you're talking about a wholly owned subsidiary company, the voting control is with the holding company, not with the directors. Board of directors of subsidiary company are accustomed to act. That situation of being accustomed to act is actually against the law. This act, as a matter of fact, has a specific section which says you cannot take anybody's instructions. A director of a company cannot take anybody's instructions. I'm referring to a section called section 166 by 3, which says, the board of directors, the directors of any company will exercise independent judgment and will not, ex, will not take instructions from anyone. So going by law, the directors of every company have to act on their own. They have to act as per their brain and their spine and not based on instructions granted by anybody. So question of a wholly owned subsidiary company being covered by 185 by 1, in my view, does not arise at all, not to look at exemptions at all. But nevertheless, the MCA has its own mind. So the MCA has given carve-outs from section 185 by 1 in two situations. The carve-outs are as follows. The carve-outs came effective 1st April. This is a point I need to stress. The carve-outs, that is the exemptions, became effective 1st April. In other words, from 12th September to 1st April, 12th September to 31st March, this exemption may not have been available. If the section at all anyway applied, Exemption was applicable from 1st April only. What is the exemption? In case of a wholly owned subsidiary company, in case of a WS, wholly owned subsidiary company, whether a loan or a guarantee will be completely exempted. So a loan given to a wholly owned subsidiary company or a guarantee given for a wholly owned subsidiary company will stay exempted from section 185 by 1. One, one exemption. Second exemption is, in case of a partly owned subsidiary company, giving of guarantees or provision of security is exempted but giving of a loan is not exempt. If the company is partly owned, company, partly owned subsidy company, granting of a loan is not exempted. Giving of guarantees or provision of securities is exempted. 
there is a rider to this to say that this loan or guarantee in either case, in case of wholly owned company or a partly owned company, must be used for the principal business of the beneficiary company. The beneficiary company must be using for its principal business, then only will the exemption be applicable. So that's the exemption from 185 by 1. 185 by 1 also has another carve out. The other carve out which is there in the section itself is that if the company giving out the loan or providing the guarantee does this activity in ordinary course of his business. Ordinary course of business is a word which is used in several sections time and again, ordinary course of business. So if the company does this in ordinary course of business, in that case, um, in that case a section will not be applicable. What's the meaning of ordinary course of business? Ordinary course of business means two things. Number one, other than lending to directors or directors affiliated entities, the company gives loans otherwise also. And the rate of interest the company is charging on such loan, in case it's a loan transaction, the rate of interest on the loan, is not less than the bank rate. The prevailing bank rate as of now is 8.75%. In other words, the loan must not be carrying an interest of less than 8.75% if the contract is one of a loan. So ordinary course of business transaction given by a company which ordinarily gives such loans, that would practically mean NBFCs, but even a company which is not an NBFC, if it's ordinarily giving loans, would stay exempted if the rate of interest on the loan is 8.75% is 8 or higher. That's an exemption from 185 by 1. Section 185, once again, contravention of section. Needless to say, some months in jail, some years in jail probably, few lakhs of fine, but the, con the prosecution would be applicable to the lender as well as the borrower. The lender is prosecutable, the borrower is also to be prosecuted. As the borrower is a director or director's entities, even the borrower would be prosecuted in terms of section 185 but 2. Okay, I am switching back to section 188 for a minute because there is an important carve out from section 188 which I did not deal with earlier. So since, since it's still, uh, it still just occurred to me, so I must discuss that carve out from section 188 very quickly before I move to section 186. The carve out is in case of arm's length transactions, section 188, the entire section will not be applicable if the contract is an arm's length contract. What's the meaning? An arm's length contract and a contract is ordinary course of business. The contract must be ordinary course of business contract and the contract must be arm's length contract, in which case the entire section 188 is completely exempted. What is arm's length contract? For tax purposes, we have a concept of arm's length pricing. Merely that the price is arm's length price does not mean the contract is arm's length contract. Price is only one part of a contract. A contract has several parts. Screening of a party, approval of a party, setting of transaction limits, setting of credit limits, granting of credit period, charging of rate of interest and so on. So from every sense, if the contract is an arm's length contract, in that case, neither of the provisions of Section 188 will be applicable to an arm's length contract. Of course, if the company has an audit committee, audit committee approval will still be required, but arm's length contracts are otherwise exempted from Section 188. So that's the requirements of 185, Section 188, with the supplement that arm's length contracts are exempted. I move to another, the, the last of the three sections I need to discuss, that's Section 186. So Section 186 deals with loans and investments. Section 186 is corresponding to Section 372A of the Old Act. Section 372A of the Old Act also dealt with, Section 372A dealt with what? Intercorporate loans and intercorporate investments. So loan from a company to a company.